lectures about uh, bacterial cultivation or how we work in the laboratory to grow uh, the various bugs that we need to grow. The basics uh, in bacterial cultivation, you've already gone through this in your micro lab. Um, we just tailor it to the clinical setting and the organisms that we know grow in the various specimens that we get. So just to remind you of some of the um, principles, we have to remember the difference between in vitro and vivo. That's one of the most important things. Um, just because the organism is growing well in the patient doesn't mean that we have a place in which to grow it in the laboratory. So in the patient or in a live organism is an in vivo situation. Um, on a auger plate is an in vitro uh, situation. Um, so we have to try and replicate as well as possible the um, environment that the uh, bacteria has inside the patient so that we can get it to grow pretty well. And we have artificial medias that allow us to do that uh, and actually grow it up um, so much better that we can actually see it. Now, different bacteria have different nutritional needs. So we have a whole bunch of different types of media that have been developed um, to suit the needs of the various pathogens that we're trying to target. Okay, some bacteria are very fastidious or fussy, um, and some bacteria are what we call non-fastidious, meaning they'll pretty much uh, live uh, if you give them the basic needs. Okay, atmosphere right, enough uh, protein sugar available for them uh, to use, they'll, they'll be pretty happy uh, as, as, as far as uh, growing in the laboratory. So in the laboratory, we're going to focus on being able to um, grow up uh, not just the majority of organisms which are non-fastidious, but also those fastidious ones that we don't want to miss. Uh, so the basics of media, we have a few different types uh, of media uh, that are available to us to use in the laboratory. Um, probably, and, and these are not given in any particular order, but broth uh, media or liquid media, uh, exactly what it sounds like, it's a liquid media. Um, and they're very useful because uh, organisms um, like to grow, um, most organisms like to grow very well in a broth media. And it's pretty easy to see when there's organisms growing in there because what was a clear broth becomes cloudy. And that's the evidence that there's growth in there. The limitations of broth media are that you can't see individual colonies and you can't manipulate the, the bacteria within the broth like you can off of a solid auger media where you can get a loop full of pure organism. Basically, the broth is just a bunch of nutrients that have been dissolved in water. Um, I mean, you could you could make a broth at home, you know, um, if you've ever left something in, you know, milk that can be a broth for the organisms and that'll sour your milk. Um, those are all different um, things that you can, you know, very easy to make at home. When you add um, agar to a broth media, you convert it from, or it's agarose, from a broth to a solid media, which will solidify the, all the nutrients, all the agents in that, <coughs> that had previously been uh, dissolved in the water. Now, we use agarose and not gelatin. Yes, we do have some gelatin medias, but we, they're not routinely used. And, and that's because agarose, we can actually heat that to a pretty high temperature um, to get it a little bit cleaner. You, you're not necessarily going to um, sterilize uh, most agars, um, especially if they have things like blood cells in them, because when you try to heat it up too high, the blood cells lice. But many agars can be sterilized if they don't have uh, living cells in them. And that allows us, um, it gives us, you know, great, um, nice, clean things to work with. Um, whereas if you were to use gelatin, gelatin has a tendency to, to melt at a lower temperature. Uh, and then we have a, a third type of or form of uh, media, and that's called biphasic. A biphasic media has both a solid phase and a liquid phase contained within it. And in the 
you routine uh, micro lab, most the most common example of that would be blood culture bottles. Blood culture bottles, while it looks like it's completely broth, if you look really closely in a blood culture bottle, there is a there are beads. So it's a resin that's inside of those uh, bottles, and that's because certain organisms really only like to grow attached to something. Now, if it's in your body, they'll attach themselves to a cell. They'll grow on this on the surface of a red cell, on the surface of an epithelial cell, something like that. Um, so when we convert those into a blood culture bottle, they need something to hold on to to grow really well. And so we add resin, uh, different types of resin that we can uh, that allow the bacteria yeah, just something to hold on to. Now the different agars are made um, of a variety of different uh, recipes, and and you can invent one yourself, and then suddenly you'll have you know some auger named after you that will grow whatever um, organism you're interested in. But basically the recipes um, of all of these um, uh, augers have to include uh, a variety of things, and, and that includes, has to have a carbon source because the bacteria needs a carbon source um, to start with. Have to have amino acid source. The bacteria want to replicate, want to produce proteins. Um, to In order to do that, proteins need amino acids. Uh, has to have electrolytes, just like you. Got to maintain that osmotic balance, and so the bacteria will maintain, uh, will um, interact with those electrolytes. It does, however, need to be pH balanced. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean neutral, but there are usually some buffers present. The main reason for that is, as the bacteria grow, they're going to produce waste, and on a, especially um, in, in our artificial media, there's no way for that waste to be eliminated. It's a closed system. So the pH balance isn't just so that the organism doesn't feel um, overwhelmed by the pH, but also because as the waste build up, there has to be something there to buffer that so that you don't produce an environment that will pre prevent the bacteria from continually growing. Now, all buffers are going to be overcome at some point. Um, so, you, you know, don't expect to do so well if you've been growing your organism, you know, up for three weeks. But um, most of our plates will be able to handle organism and allow it to grow fairly well uh, for a week or, or even more, two weeks. And then um, the presence of indicators is optional. Some uh, agar plates do have indicators, others don't. And the indicators can be for um, any characteristic that you're looking for. The most common one that we would be looking for is, um, say, lactose fermentation. So if an organism is capable of producing, of, of fermenting lactose, uh, there are indicators present in some media that can demonstrate that to us. And um, we'll get into uh, how that works uh, going forward. Uh, but most of the indicators are pH you know, markers, and they, you just see the buildup of uh, various acids or bases in the, in the agar. Now, any media that you're going to come across is going to be classified as one of four different types of media, not or a combination thereof. So we have um, four basic types, and uh, the a media can be one, or a, uh, it can actually fit into more than one of these characteristics at the same time. Uh, the first type is an enrichment uh, media. Uh, an enrichment media contains the specific uh, nutrients that are required for the growth of a particular um, organism. So for example, um, uh, chocolate agar is a an enrichment media, and or uh, BCYE also an enrichment um, agar. Uh, chocolate agar uh, is it's colored, it's brown, the color of chocolate, um, and basically that has been enriched with hemin uh, from lysed red blood cells, um, which is required for the growth of certain fastidious organisms such as Haemophilus. Okay, um, so chocolate agar specifically is targeting that pathogen group. Are there other things that can grow on an enrichment media? Yes, lots of other things can grow in enrichment media. Most other things can grow in an enrichment media. However, the, um, the organism with which you're targeting, Haemophilus in this case, can't grow on other medias that don't have that enrichment in it. Uh, and that's the point. 
BCYE um, is also an enrichment uh, media and it's for um, Legionella and it's been enriched with uh, cysteine, which uh, Legionella requires um, for growth. It can't, can't uh, uh, manufacture its own, so it needs to get it from the environment. And in this case, the environment is the acre. Uh, a second uh, classification are the supportive um, medias. Uh, a supportive media is uh, probably the most basic type. This will support the growth of most non-fastidious organisms. And our most common uh, one that we use is tryptocase soy agar with 5% sheep blood, otherwise called a blood agar plate, BAP. Okay. Um, but it is actually a tryptocase soy agar and they've added blood to that. Um, and that'll grow almost anything. The, mostly the non-fastidious organisms. And there are several other types of supportive medias. You have tryptocase soy agar, you have, uh, you have nutrient agar. There's a bunch of different supportive agars that allow us to grow up anything. But the, the blood plate, that's our most common that we use. Um, and we'll come, at, that's, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, a selective uh, agar. A selective agar um, specifically inhibits certain groups of, or a group or certain groups of organisms, except for the group that you're targeting, the one that you're looking for. Um, and our, uh, we have several types of selective agars, uh, many types of selective agars. But basically what this allows you to do is to eliminate the growth of an entire class of bugs so that you can favor the growth of another. So in a particular area, when you're looking for, say, um, you know, for example, the stool has lots of gram negatives. OK, well, we're if we want to look for gram positive pathogens, we do we really want to weed through all those gram negatives at the same time? So if we use a gram positive plate like a CNA or a PEA, the gram negatives won't grow and we can just look at the gram positives that grow. Um, many of our pl the plates that we use uh, are called the enteric plates are specific or they're selective for gram negatives. So they eliminate the growth of all gram positives and they allow the gram negatives to grow up. And we can look at just the gram negatives that are there. An example of that is the McConkie plate or MAC plate um, here. The MAC plate um, is a, it's a pink plate and it specifically grows up gram negative organisms. Um, and it uh, inhibits the growth or prevents the growth of gram positives. Okay. Another example is the MTM or the modified Thayer Martin. Uh, this is actually a, or a plate that's selective specifically for Neisseria gonorrhea. So this will inhibit the growth of pretty much everything. Um, and it'll select only for the growth of, Thayer, of uh, Neisseria gonorrhea. So this is specifically used in um, or, uh, cultures like, for example, a genital culture, when you want to rule out that pathogen, um, but the genital um, source has so many other, um, so much normal flora that it's hard to, for Neisseria gonorrhea to grow out so that we can notice it. So this plate is used to inhibit all that other stuff and let GC grow up on its own. And then we have a differential plate. The differential plate um, is um, yet another tool that we use in the laboratory, and it allows us to differentiate one bacteria type from another based on some characteristic that we're targeting in this plate, usually some biochemical difference. So for example, on uh, this green plate here, this is called a hectone plate. This plate here, or HE, so this is a hectone or an HE plate, this plate here um, as you can see, it's the plate itself is green, so it would have been this green color uh, before we inoculated it. And this plate is both selective and differential. So the hectone plate selects specifically for gram negatives. So the only things that can grow on here are gram negative organisms, but it's also differential. And so we're looking for, at a couple of things that happen on the HE uh, plate. We can see that there are some yellow colonies. You can see this yellow colony here, and we have black colonies. The, um, the plate itself can differentiate between lactose fermenters and non-lactose fermenters. 
If a colony is yellow on an HE plate, it is a lactose fermenter. If it is green, if it has no color, then it is a non-lactose fermenter. So when I say it's green, so if you just had a colony here uh, that was growing here and the color of the plate was coming through, the green color of the plate, then that would be considered a non-lactose fermenter. So that's one way it's differentiating. Another way it's differentiating is that the plate can um, tell you if an, a particular organism can produce hydrogen sulfide. And if it can, then you get this black colony here. Okay, so there's lots of things that you can add to your uh, plate in order to develop um, a, a different, a, a way to differentiate between the, the pathogens that you're looking for, and that's what it's based on. You know, what pathogen am I looking for here? And then we also have, um, so those are the four basic types of plates that you're going to use, but then we also have various metabolic test medias. Um, and those are medias that are developed specifically to look for a particular characteristic. Those are the, the metabolic test medias would not be used um, for, from, to plate a particular specimen onto. They would be used more in working up an isolate that you've already grown out. So if you grow out, for example, if we grow out this particular um, black colony here, we might want to place that colony on a urea agar, which is a metabolic test media, um, and it would be able to tell us whether or not that colony can produce urea or not. Now, the, um, these charts that follow um, include a whole bunch of different um, uh, plates, and they show you uh, basically what the plate is, uh, the name of the plate, the, the type of plate that it is. Is it enrichment, differential, supportive, uh, all of those things, or what combination thereof? So, for example, here we have the sheep blood auger, and we already know that that's a supportive plate. Um, but it also happens to be, and this should be an S, it should not be an E. Oh, that's a mistake. The, uh, this should be an S. So um, it is a supportive and a differential plate. Um, most non-fastidious organisms will grow on it. It has, it's a tryptocase soy with 5% sheep blood, but it is also differential in that it allows us to detect um, hemolysis um, and what kinds of hemolysis a particular organism can produce. There are three types of hemolysis, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but we use a sheep blood plate in order to detect um, the type of hemolysis that an organism produces, if, if any. I'm not gonna read all of these to you. These charts are here for you to read through, to look at. These are the things you need to know about them. You need to know that chocolate agar, and I gave you the abbreviation as well, um, is an enrichment agar, that it grows Haemophilus and Neisseria, as well as everything else, but it's specifically for the isolation of Haemophilus and Neisseria, and what it does. It, su it supplies the X and V factors, which is uh, hemin and NAD, and that there are special considerations for the chocolate agar. You have to incubate it in CO2, okay? It's a rule for that one. And so on, you'll go down the line. Uh, CNA, or Columbia uh, Callistinaldic Acid Agar, uh, and so on down the line, okay? A couple of things that I just wanna point out here. Um, you can see that some of them, the differential ones usually have um, markers. For example, you have eosin and methylene blue in the, um, in the EMB plate. Those don't just inhibit um, gram-positive bacilli, uh, gram-positive organisms, but also they allow us to detect um, uh, changes in pH, which tell us if it's a lactose fermenter or not. McConkie, same thing. We have uh, crystal violet, which acts to inhibit gram positives and lets us know if, um, if it's a lactose fermenter or not. Um, another thing that I want to point out are bile salts. When you see a plate that has uh, bile salts in it, you know that that is most likely for a gram negative. If it has large amounts of bile salts in it, then that allows us to detect the, ability, the um, production of H2S. So just to differentiate here, both McConkie and HE have bile salts in them. But the bile salts 
concentration in Makanki is relatively low compared to the HE. The HE has large amounts, which is why we can detect H2S in the HE agar, but not in the Makanki agar.